Um, and many of the accidents that have occurred in Australia and overseas, of course, are just pilot error, um, momentary malfunctions of aircraft, lack of pre-flight inspections, um, you know, the sort of thing that happens. And they're just one-offs and they're pure accidents. But every now and again, there's an accident which has some considerable consequences. And we had one here in Western Australia in 1930 when a push moth, which had been bought by Wings Limited, crashed in the Darling Ranges. I'd like to draw your attention to that particular wing strut there. Uh, it was a perfectly normal strut, used on several aircraft before and since, but it was to play a very, very significant part in what followed over the next three years. Um, they bought this push moth uh, in order to extend the range of their operations. Uh, they only had a Simmons Spartan and a Gypsy moth, which could only be used for training pilots. They wanted to do some charter work and general um, service work with an aircraft, so they wanted something with three seats, uh, pilot and two passengers. The Puss Moth was very new, it was first released in March 1930. It was a beautiful little aircraft, aerodynamically very clean, top speed of about 130, it cruised at about 110, and was reputed to be an extraordinarily pleasant aircraft to fly. And that's, that's the aircraft that arrived on the 17th of September 1930, was quickly assembled at Maylands, took part in a big uh, aerial pageant on the 12th of October, uh, with Snook, Captain Snook flying it, and on the next day, on the 13th of October, Charles Nesbitt, who was the chief pilot of Wings, took off from Maylands at 10 a.m. with two passengers, Heidi Ray and William Bell, on a navigational exercise over the Darling Range. They hadn't come back by midday, which caused some anxiety, but by 2 p.m. That, that had changed to alarm and despondency because they, something obviously had happened. Uh, aerial searches were made, and finally a ground party found the aircraft late in the afternoon. And this was the, the scene that they came upon. It was a, a very bad crash. The aircraft had come down vertically, as you can see. It had um, hit the trees on the way through. All three passengers were killed. Uh, and the searchers found that part of the starboard aileron and part of the starboard wing were some considerable distance away from the crash site which uh, was found by the investigating committee to indicate that there had been a substantial structural failure of the aircraft in flight. Well, the Havilands in England were notified, and they were fairly casual about it. They thought, oh, it's just another accident. But their chief test pilot, Hubert Broad, took a push moth up in 1931, in January 31, about four months later, and he put it through its paces and said, no problems, beautiful aircraft, no difficulties at all. Until May of 1931, <coughs> when um, there was another push moth crash in South Africa. And this time it was Lieutenant Commander Glenn Kitson, uh, who owned the Lockheed Vega that Horry Miller bought to fly in the Centenary Air Race in 1934. Kitson was very well known, very much liked, as an expert pilot. And so this raised a little bit of a consternation of two similar accidents occurring so close together. Again, it was a total wing failure. <coughs> in Australia, there was a chap called Charlie Pratt over in Sydney, very good aircraft engineer, and he worked out what he thought was the problem with the aircraft. So he modified one locally. What he did was, <coughs> he put a jury strut in from that main strut up to the wing root at the aft end of the wing. And he also put an extra brace in down here. Uh, but no one took much notice of this. Uh, he did it purely as a solo exercise. He felt that that was the way that the aircraft could be fixed. The de Havilland Aircraft Company made a bit of an effort. They decided it was probably the main spar that was the problem. So they issued kits for, for owners to modify the main spar of their aircraft. And some owners did, and some didn't. It was, it was not obligatory. Everything else was going normally. The, the aircraft was making some record flights. Amy Johnson flew one to, from Croydon to Tokyo. And coincidentally, on the very day that Nesbitt crashed in the Darling Ranges, a push moth had flown from Croydon in England to, 
to the uh, Johannesburg in South Africa without any problems at all. They were being used all over the world now for all sorts of record attempts with no troubles. <coughs> but in November of 1931, another one went in, this time in South Africa, same wing failure, and it was the same aircraft which had actually done that Croydon to Johannesburg flight on the 13th of October, the year before. Now, the Havilands were in a situation here where there were aircraft <coughs> crashing regularly with the same structural failure, but there were dozens of Puth they made 260 of them altogether. There were dozens of them flying around doing long distance flights uh, of several thousand miles with no problems whatsoever. So it was a little bit difficult for them to decide whether there really was something wrong or whether the pilots were doing something, something crazy and causing these aircraft to crash. Um, but then there was a breakthrough. Uh, in May 1932, a Canadian Puss Moth, fitted with floats, uh, crashed in Canada and the pilot survived. And he was able to give them an idea of what had happened. He said there was a lot of violent flutter in the aircraft uh, and then the strut gave way and the wing came off. Luckily, he was able to get the thing down onto water and he survived the crash. Um, well, that sort of got de Havilland's beginning to worry about just exactly what, what had gone wrong with that strut. And while they were worrying about it, another one crashed in Surrey, killing three people. Uh, and at this stage, the Australian authorities began to feel that they should do something about it. <laughs> Uh, things were fairly casual in those days. So they um, contacted de Havilland and de Havilland said, no, we're certain it's the weather. We think it's all these aircraft have crashed in very bad weather. Uh, and you, you, you must realise that if, for example, you had a little small yacht and you took it out into the North Atlantic in the, in the face of a winter storm, you'd sink. And it's the same with aircraft. If you take them into totally unsuitable weather conditions, uh, then there is a very real risk that they will be damaged. Uh, I thought it was a rather, rather cute analogy. Uh, in September of 1932, another accident occurred, this time much closer to home, when Ralph Virtue, Les Holden and Dr Hamilton were killed when another Puss Moth crashed at Byron Bay in New South Wales. And this stirred the Australian authorities right up and they grounded the, the DH-80s. Uh, de Havilland didn't like it. They said there's nothing wrong with the aircraft uh, and a lot of correspondence flowed backwards and forwards and the whole thing was becoming very complicated. And while this was, always go while this was going on, there was another one crashed in France, killing the passengers and their pilot. Uh, <coughs> so finally de Havilland put the whole matter in the hands of the Royal Aircraft Establishment at Farnborough and they tested the push moth to destruction by loading the wings with sandbags until they collapsed. Uh, and they just they said, if what you need to do is to fit the jewelry strut, you need to change from box spars to solid spars in the wings, you need to modify the ailerons with mass balances, and you need to increase the size of the tail, uh, and that'll cure it. Um, it didn't worry the Havilands very much because during the course of the aircraft they'd made 610 modifications to it. This was only five, so this was the least of their worries. Anyhow, uh, another, another point that was a worry was the attachment of the wing at the top there. They were folding wings and they felt that that was a, a weakness and so the whole of the cabin roof was also modified. It still looked like a push mod. <laughs> it was a bit different from the ones that first came out. So the local people decided, all right, the Havilands have done the right thing. We'll lift the suspensions. Uh, Hudson Fisher Qantas had two of them, and he was most unhappy about the whole setup. He told the controller of civil aviation there's no way in the world he'd ever fly one. In fact, he, he, so, he sold his aircraft. He wouldn't, he wouldn't put them in the air. So everything then began to settle down until January of 1933, and Hinkler crashed in the Italian Alps. Now the Hinkler crash is a very contentious one. Um, there have been several reasons explained for Hinkler's crash, but there is no doubt that a wing detached of the aircraft. So it's a possible that it was the same problem. And then 
In June 1933, a Puss Moth crashed in Siam, again with a wing failure. And these aircraft had been modified. So <laughs> this put the, the pot back on the boil well and truly. Um, and then two months later, a chap flying from the Congo to uh, Britain uh, was lost over Africa, again when a wing failed. And that was the last crash. From then on, there were no more crashes. The Puss Moth went on to make some incredibly long and historic flights. Jim Mollison flew one from east to west across the Atlantic, solo. Uh, he flew across the South Atlantic. <coughs> Amy Johnson made several flights to Cape Town in, in record-breaking attempts. Melrose flew one to Australia. Uh, Matthews uh, flew one out in September 1930, just before the crash of uh, Nesbitt, flew one from England to Darwin. And so you finished up with this enigma that there was obviously something wrong with the aircraft, but there were dozens of owners who had no problems whatsoever. Well, this enigma was never really satisfactorily resolved, but I think what actually happened, according to some correspondence I've seen from de Havilland's, that people began to realise that the aircraft had a safety operating envelope. And if they went outside it, they were going to be in trouble. Now, almost all of these crashes had occurred in conditions of, he of heavy turbulence and also usually probably at top speed or in dives. And so I think the owners of the aircraft thought, right, we can't do this. We've got to watch the weather. We've got to watch the speed. And from then on, there were no more problems at all. And there's still two or three Puss Moths flying today. Uh, so that finally, in a rather unsatisfactory way, wrapped up the Puss Moth enigma. There were nine serious crashes. 17 people lost their lives. And uh, no one was ever able to satisfactorily explain why some aircraft failed and some didn't. There's a strange little coincidental twist at the end of this story. Oh, uh, that's a, another Puss Moth. That's, that's with the de Havilland modifications. They're a bit different from Charlie Platt's. Uh, they've still got that jewelry strut in there, but they didn't fit the forehead strut. They didn't consider that was necessary. It's got the bigger tail plane and the strength of wind spars. In almost 21 years and two days after Nesbitt crashed in the Darling Ranges, the, uh, the Havilland Dove from Airlines WA, the company that Snook had founded, uh, radioed Kalgoorlie and said they were on descent and they'd expect to land in seven minutes. They never arrived. The wreckage was found and the port wing uh, engine and undercarriage was found about three quarters of a mile away from the wreck. So it was obvious that the wing had parted company from the aircraft. Well, the reaction to that was in sharp contrast to the Puss Moth crash. The next day, DCA grounded every dove in Australia. Uh, airlines had a dove at Kalgoorlie, which they trucked down to Perth. Uh, Albert Armfield examined it and found a one and three quarter inch crack in the main spar. Uh, and two and a half months later, de Havilland's had designed, built and shipped to Australia brand new wing spars and the doves were back in the air in January. And I think that makes a very interesting contrast with the way the Puss Moth disasters were handled. But of course, 31 years later, things had changed considerably. Thank you very much. Thank you.